we have someone else trying to join? Nope, that was the recording starting. Recording? Good to go. Okay. <clears throat> this is Hearthstone's last webinar, and it is Your Vote Counts. And our presenter is Lisa Puth, who is the director of the ARC, uh, state director, I believe, of the ARC, which is an organization which does many good things, including advocacy for uh, people with disabilities. And Lisa has agreed to talk to us tonight on the importance of your vote and that your vote really counts. So I hope that that you listen carefully and get some good ideas because voting is very important and affects all of our lives. So Lisa, do you wanna go ahead and start? Sure, uh, thank you for having me as a presenter this evening. I know after I speak with you a little bit about some of the really important issues that are worth paying attention to in this election and beyond. I know that you're going to hear from Chris Williams from the area talking more specifically about voter issues and some of the important deadlines and practicalities of how to make sure your vote is cast this season. So um, stick around for that after I'm done giving you the disability issue presentation. So thank you again for having me. And I know Alex is going to put up my slides. Yeah, they just go away for a second. Okay, just one sec here. I had it a second ago. There we go. Okay, we're all getting used to new technologies these days, I know. The good and the bad. So your vote counts. This is tonight's talk. Go ahead and change the slide, Alex. So we'll talk about um, why disability advocates must vote, why it's important. I'll give you an overview of some of the key issues and some sample questions that you can ask of candidates and policymakers. We'll talk a little bit about actually how to contact your policymakers, and then we'll go into some of the voting basics and those deadlines that you need to remember. So just a little bit about the ARC Wisconsin. We are a statewide organization, actually part of a national network that includes more than 600 chapters across the country. You maybe have heard of the ARC before. There are uh, 14 local chapters in communities across Wisconsin. You see the stars on the state of Wisconsin there. We are an advocacy organization that supports people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families, and have been around really since the 1950s. So it's a pleasure to partner with Hearthstone as you guys do really great work in the Sheboygan area. So I wanted to share with you some voting resources that I'll be um, talking about tonight. And I was able to partner with the Wisconsin Disability Vote Coalition, and I'll be sharing some of their resources tonight. And I certainly urge you to check out Disability Vote Coalition's website, where you'll find a lot more specific information on voting for people with disabilities. Next slide. So why does it matter that uh, people from the disability, people with disabilities vote? Um, elected officials do make a lot of decisions that are very important to people with disabilities. Um, everything from the funding for the supports that people with disabilities receive, workers that might come into your home or support you on a job or um, a place that you might go during the day to receive services, all of those services are typically funded through government resources, whether it be from the state of the Wisconsin or um, through the federal government. So those decisions are made by elected officials. And elected officials really need to know that we care and are paying attention to what's happening in elections. Um, our vote is like money, it's like currency. We're showing uh, where we wanna invest our money, where we wanna invest our vote. And elected officials can look up voting records to see who is voting. They can't tell who you voted for, but they sure can see who votes. And it's really important for them to see people with disabilities and family members engaged on the issues in voting. Um, really the way um, it, you do have an opportunity to educate and help to change an elected official's mind and to really help them to better understand disability issues. And I really like this fact at the end of the slide, if people with disabilities voted at the same rate as people without disabilities, there'd be 2 million more votes. So we really are an underrepresented group and it's so important to try to get more people with disabilities out to the polls this fall. Next slide. 
So just a little preview of what you're going to see on your ballot. I know Chris uh, can talk a little bit more about this too, but there are some really important things happening in this November 3rd election. I just pulled up the sample ballot or sample issues from the Sheboygan area ballot. And so everybody in the state is going to be voting on um, are the candidates who are running for the office of U.S. president. I don't think that's any secret, but you in the Sheboygan area also have a congressional representative on your ballot. Um, so you'll see those two names um, uh, for that office. And then also, depending on where you live, you might have a state senator and or different names for assembly representatives. So I think I pulled up something from Sheboygan Falls. And so you have two names there, but you do have... Um, a state senator who is running as well in in some of the districts that cover Sheboygan County. So these are people both again in Washington and in Madison who make really important decisions about programs like Family Care and Iris, um, programs like the Children's Long-Term Support System waiver system and the Katie Beckett waiver. So they're very important um, they're very important issues that will be in front of these elected officials. So um, make sure that you, you know what your ballot looks like for November 3rd. Next slide. So I know Chris is gonna go over with this in more detail, but it can't hurt to review it uh, uh, several times in this presentation. Um, uh, voter registration, uh, today I think is the last day to um, register online. Chris is nodding mm -hmm. her head, uh, but you can do in person at your clerk's office through Friday, uh, October 30th, and then in person at the polling place on election day. Um, of course, there's certain requirements to that in terms of bringing a photo ID and, and other sorts of information, but those are the deadlines. Early voting, which is the early voting or in-person absentee voting. Um, and I know Chris is going over the locations and times for that. And then absentee, the uh, deadlines to request absentee ballot for regular voters, October 29th. And then there is something called an indefinitely confined voter. Um, generally people who just can't get out of their house uh, for most of the time. There's a pretty tight definition on that, but that deadline is October 30th. Next slide. So some key federal issues, things that are just happening in Washington right now that disability advocates are paying attention to. So you might have heard on the news the back and forth between the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate around COVID relief. Um, early on in the pandemic, there was um, the CARES Act pass it, passed that went to states and provided significant amounts of funding. Wisconsin is dispersing CARES Act funding right now. I just got a message today about um, new payments to providers in the family care and IRIS system, so adult long-term support system that came through the CARES Act. That money has to be spent by the end of the year. Um, small businesses also got a boost in that package. A lot of that money is either gone or will be gone shortly. And there is a great sense and states are asking for additional federal funding. But unfortunately, our friends in Washington can't seem to reach agreement. That is no surprise. Um, but the House of Representatives has passed um, a couple of bills, and most recently, they uh, just several weeks ago, they passed a trimmed down COVID relief package trying to find agreement with the um, US Senate. And we really like what's in that bill. It um, includes additional and dedicated funding for Medicaid home and community-based services. When I say home and community-based services, I really am talking about funding for programs like Family Care and IRIS, funding for providers in Sheboygan County like RCS um, and other um, people who provide in-home supports for you would generally be receiving funding through home and community-based services. And those providers are really in need of help and support. Um, they have a lot of extra expenses due to the COVID pandemic, or they might have reduced revenues because people aren't coming in to use their services in the same way. So this is a lot of people say it's desperate needed. We're very glad that the House included funding for home and community-based services. They also include additional matching funding in the general Medicaid program. So you see this reference in my slide here, federal Medicaid medical assistance percentage. That's called the FMAP. It's the federal match 
So every time a state spends a dollar on Medicaid programs, which could be Badger Care, Katie Beckett, it could be uh, Medicaid dollars spent in family care or IRIS programs. The federal government matches that at about 60%. Well, this bill would raise that percentage of match to help states out more. Um, we think this is going to be incredibly important, uh, particularly as state revenues are down and states are in really difficult situations with their, they'll be in very difficult situations with their state budgets, as will Wisconsin. But you see here in, in yellow um, that uh, we don't have agreement with the Senate. We don't know what's going to happen with the COVID relief bill. Uh, uh, many people think it should have already happened, but I'm not sure if it'll happen until after the election. But um, anyway, something definitely to watch that impacts people with disabilities. Of course, in the news right now is the Supreme Court nomination process. Um, there are several key cases that will be for be before the Supreme Court that will impact people with disabilities. A lot of people are very concerned about what will happen with the Affordable Care Act, particularly as it relates to pre-existing conditions. Um, people with disabilities are inherently have pre-existing conditions. Not all people are, have access to Medicaid and programs uh, like family care and IRIS and without protections for pre-existing conditions. It's really, really hard for people to afford the premiums and the drug costs to maintain their health. Um, so that is that is a concern um, in terms of what cases the Supreme Court will take up shortly after the election. Next slide. So what are some things to pay attention to? What are some key issues that you want to be thinking about as we head into the election? And if you have the ability to talk to a policymaker or a candidate, that you're going to really want to ask them some hard questions about. So I've been talking about the adult long-term care system and the Medicaid system, because uh, I know that's really important to Hearthstone members. So in Sheboygan County, I just pulled some current data for you guys. Um, there are are uh, close to a thousand people who use the family care program and about uh, almost 300 people who use the IRIS program. You've got about 130 children who are receiving long-term services and supports. Those are children with significant disabilities. Um, 1,600 who the state says are receiving SSI, supplemental security income, and therefore accessing Medicaid through SSI. Those are generally people with disabilities. And then there's about 558 people who use the MAP program, um, which is a Medicaid buy-in program that helps people to work but maintain their Medicaid. Again, these are generally the numbers of who are people with disabilities who use uh, Medicaid programming. A lot of the other people, you see there's total Medicaid enrollment in Sheboygan County of almost 20,000 people. Um, a lot of those people are children. So those are, those are people who are probably eligible for um, Medicaid because of low income. And there are a lot of children in the Medicaid program who receive just basic health care. Um, the concern here uh, for people with disabilities is that there is a lack of direct care workers. We don't have enough people who are able to um, who providers can hire to support people with disabilities, either as personal care workers or perhaps job coaches, um, people who work at day services and other facilities, maybe somebody who comes into your home, helps you with grocery shopping. We just don't have enough people doing that work. Um, and that's in part related to the rates. Um, there hasn't been any significant rate increases in the Family Care IRIS program in many years. Um, and that's because uh, we haven't had significant new funding put into those programs by the state legislature. Um, so a lot of times what that means is that people are eligible for these programs. They might um, be be told that they should get more hours of care, but they can't find workers to um, to provide the care. So what then the repercussions of that is that sometimes people are forced into nursing homes or other really expensive facilities, and that ends up costing the state a lot of money. Um, so that definitely is a concern that we've probably always had, but that has just gotten worse um, over the last several years. So next slide. 
So this is some new data that I wanted to share with you. This data actually isn't public, so you're getting some exclusive information here. It should be public soon. Um, the Department of Health Services has been tracking the impact of COVID-19 on um, adults with disabilities. So the numbers that you're seeing on the screen are the number of deaths specifically from COVID-19 within the Family Care and IRIS program. So you see 250 deaths. And then it's I think it's interesting to look at the percent of COVID-19 cases within these programs that are resulting in people dying. Um, you see that's 12% when you compare that to state, the statewide numbers, um, one just one percent of people who contract COVID nineteen um, uh, end up uh, dying from it. So we know that our population is extremely vulnerable. And when you look over at hospitalizations, kind of the same concern is that you're seeing that the number of, or the percentage of COVID-19 cases in the family care and IRS programs that end up in hospitalizations. 36.8% compared to just uh, about 6% in the state. So this is a very vulnerable population and we're glad that the state is collecting this data and we'd hope it becomes public soon, which they keep saying it will. I'm hoping for next week and I can let you know, but this is the sort of data that would be important to share with a policymaker to make them aware of how critical these programs are and how important it is to get them additional funding so they can keep people safe. Um, they have they have vul very vulnerable health conditions and without enough workers and without enough um, personal protective equipment, these people can get very sick very quickly. Next slide. So another key issue, and I've really just been pretty much mentioning it all along, is the direct care workforce shortage. If you're gonna to talk to any provider in the Sheboygan County area, they're gonna tell you that this is a huge problem. So, and it's and it's only gonna get worse. In 2019, Wisconsin had about 72,000 direct care workers. And when I say direct care worker, this could be somebody who is helping people get out of bed in the morning, helping them with their meals, helping them get dressed, helping them get to work, uh, providing job coaching support, somebody who helps them at a day services center or perhaps at a, um, at a, at a, in a group home or at a sheltered workshop. Those are all in the bucket of a direct care worker. Um, in 2026, the, the economy estimates will need 90, 93,000 workers. So that's not that far away. Part of this is because um, Wisconsin's aging at a pretty rapid rate. And so a lot of older adults are going to be in need of care um, and that's only going to increase. And we just don't have enough people to provide the care. Um, the, and part of it is, you know, it's not that great of a job. These workers make an average of $10 an hour. They often can't afford health insurance. But so here they're still doing, you know, pretty high risk work. They can't social distance when they're providing direct cares to someone. And yet, and um, in a lot of cases, they aren't, they don't have access to the same um, personal protective equipment or PPE that's being supplied in nursing homes and hospitals. And then they make $10 an hour and they can't afford their health insurance. So it really is um, a precarious situation for these workers. Um, a lot of providers reporting um, vacancies and increasing in vacancies. And um, again, this is a significant issue for people who live in those places because um, they, they might not be getting out of bed or getting a bath. I mean, that's the day-to-day -day struggle with this shortage. Next slide. So family caregivers then often pick up the burden when um, there aren't enough direct care workers. So AARP estimates there's more than 580,000 family caregivers in Wisconsin. So those are family caregivers for older adults and people with disabilities generally. Um, and so these family caregivers are filling in the gaps. They often are using their own personal resources um, to provide care. They take time off of work. Sometimes they reduce their work hours or quit their jobs. This is just not sustainable to rely on families to provide this care. Um, in the intellectual developmental disabilities world, about 75% of adults in Wisconsin live at home with their parents. And more than a quarter of those people are living with a caregiver 
you're over age 60. So as you can imagine, these older caregivers are also starting to experience health concerns of their own. And it's going to continue to be really unsustainable for an elderly mom and dad to provide care to an adult son or daughter with IDD without any sort of break or any um, direct care worker to help them out. I share on here a picture of what is the front cover of the caregiver, the governor's task force on caregiving recommendations. Um, I'm a co-chair of the governor's task force on caregiving. Governor Evers last year established the governor's task force on caregiving to address the issues that I just talked about, these family caregiver issues, the direct care workforce issues. And he said, bring me some solutions. So we sat in a room uh, for over a year, about 30 of us that were appointed by the governor. And at the table were, you know, nursing home providers, adult family home providers, personal care providers, family caregivers, people with disabilities, um, older adult caregivers, and we came up with about 16 proposals that are included in this report. And I know I sent the slides to Alex and he'll be sending them out so you'll have access to the link. But I really urge you to look at this report and find the things in there that you think will help people in your community. And as I said earlier, I'm gonna tell you some things that I hope you will do with your policymakers and candidates, but one of them for sure is sharing either this whole report or parts of this report that you think can really make a difference. Because right now, it's just a report. It's just words on a piece of paper and um, without policymakers just um, championing it and implementing it and putting funding behind it, it's not going to um, go anywhere. So next slide. I include in this presentation special education issues because I believe Hearthstone also has um, family members of young children and, and or certainly does outreach to family members of young children, but this is a pretty significant issue. I pulled some Sheboygan Area School District data. This is data that anybody can get on the Department of Public Instruction website, and you can you know look by whatever school district that you or your children happen to be in, um, but this is the Sheboygan Area School District. District, they have about uh, almost 1,800 students with disabilities that makes up about 17.7% of their student population. So they're quite a bit higher than the state average percentage of 14%. Um, like many other school districts, the performance of students with disabilities is pretty poor um, and there's a pretty big gap. So eighth grade math scores for students with disabilities, only 6.4% of students with disabilities in the Sheboygan Area School District score proficient. So um, that means our kids aren't, aren't learning math. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. And some people think that part of it has to do with lagging funding that will help to train teachers, put more staff in the classrooms and help students to have access to better um, accommodations and support. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting about the Sheboygan Area School District is that only 63% of students with disabilities spend 80% or more of their day with their general education peers. Now that sounds like a lot of garbledy gook, but when I read that, what that says to me is that there is some segregating of students with disabilities that's happening in the Sheboygan Area School District. They're not, they're not doing quite as well as they should with inclusion. What we know about inclusion, and inclu inclusion is not mainstreaming, but inclusion is where students with disabilities are in the same grade level classroom as their same age peers with the appropriate supports and staffing to help that student to learn. And there, it's not a student in the back of the classroom dumped there without supports. It's called inclusion. And when that happens, what we know is that even students with the most significant disabilities can make progress in grade level content. We know that our kids can do better than 6.4% proficiency in math. And that was the only stat I shared with you. All of that is online as well, but their English language um, scores really aren't any better. Um, 
Students with disabilities are also far more likely to experience inappropriate seclusion or restraint and to be suspended and expelled. And this isn't true of just Sheboygan, it's kind of across the board, but um, there are some significant underfunding issues of special education. And we're very, very concerned that with the lack of state revenues coming up in the next, next state budget, that public schools are really going to be even more at risk. Next slide. I feel like I'm sharing all sorts of bad news with you tonight. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I'll try to be more positive as we come up with what we're gonna do about the information. So, um, so key issues of impact of COVID-19 on students with disabilities, you're probably hearing about this in your communities that um, I know I certainly am, that families really are struggling to juggle working from home, caring for their children with complex needs, facilitating education for students who need a lot of individual attention. You know, depending on where you live, your school district might be back to in-person instruction, it might be doing virtual, or it might be doing some sort of a combination. But regardless, school really has changed for all students in many ways, and parents have had to take on a much more significant significant role. And even with just the shutdown that we had earlier this spring, many students with disabilities have fallen even further behind than they were before. And how do you catch up from that? Um, also for students who have, you know, compromised health conditions, the decision to go back to, to um, in-person schooling and activities, even if it's available, is a very difficult one. They're concerned for their students' safety, they're concerned for their students' medical needs, but at the same time, with the social isolation that people are experiencing and the lack of activities, that's really hard. We might have lost Lisa. Oh no. Oh, there we go. You're oh, back, Lisa. Back. Oh, I warned you about that, didn't I? <laughs> um, so students, um, students do have different and and generally more needs uh, related to the pandemic, and we really still don't know how schools are going going to be able to address that. Next slide. Okay, so here's where I get to. What you know, I always like to give people the what do you what are we going to do about it part because I feel like you know it's one thing to know what the problems are and to be able to have a good conversation with somebody about all the things that are wrong, but then we then it's important to think about what is your role in the situation and how can you take steps to maybe make something better, and so I. Um, like to remind people that both candidates and all elected officials, people who aren't on the ballot, they work for you and uh, they want to your, your vote and they should be earning your vote. So it's important to be asking them um, these important questions about disability issues. So I give you some sample questions on this slide. They're pretty simple. You know, based upon what I just told you about key issues, you might ask a candidate, um, how will you ensure that people with disabilities and older adults can continue to live and work in their communities and stay out of expensive uh, Medicaid funded institutions and nursing homes? Um, what steps will you take to address the community-based direct care workforce crisis so that people have access to personal care and home health workers? What will you do to ensure our neighborhood public schools have the resources to improve outcomes for students with disabilities so they are college and career ready and do not fall further behind? And then, like I mentioned, you know, ask your policymaker to support the governor's task force on caregiving recommendations. Again, any one of those could be um, something that you share um, with policymakers. So next slide. So here's here's my idea. So you could you could copy and paste or retype any of those questions. Go go find a candidate's um, Facebook page. Go find your legislator's Facebook page. Post a question on there. Write a letter to the editor. Ask a question at a candidate forum. I don't know if there are any um, candidate forums or virtual town halls happening in your area. I know Congressman Go Grothman often has um, virtual town halls, um, but it's possible some of the other candidates in your area 
might be um, hosting forums or, or town halls virtually. Um, you can always invite a candidate to come into a meeting if you have a Hearthstone meeting um, that you're doing by Zoom or some other way. Why not invite a candidate to share their views on disability issues, share questions ahead of time. Um, but I, I like the simple um, idea of posting on Facebook pages, or if you're into Twitter, um, oftentimes just tweeting at somebody, finding their Twitter handle is a really good way to get their attention. I also like, you see on the left-hand side, um, the, the uh, website that I put up there, wisconsinvote.org, and then this, this um, forward slash candidates races, um, they, they actually make it really easy for you. They will show you all of the candidates um, running in your area and then link directly to their Facebook page, their Twitter, whatever, um, whatever social media they have, their website, so you can figure out how to contact them. You can email them. I did look up before I joined you um, for a Sheboygan address, and sure enough, you know, like Congressman Grothman, he has a whole bunch of different ways that you can contact. Him. So that's a great way to go. Um, if you're looking to contact your elected officials, um, like the representatives who um, cover your area, so um, I think you have um, Senator Dewey Strobel in some of the Sheboygan County area, and then Senator, oh, I'm blanking on his name, but I can see his face. Um, Anyway, this is how you would get a hold of them. You would either go to this website or you can call that 800 number. And at the 800 number, you just they're going to ask for your address and they're going to tell you who represents you and the phone number to get a hold of them. So it's a, that's just a really easy way to find out who they are. And then you can take any of these questions or talk about any of the issues that I shared this evening or um, any ones that are really relevant for you in your daily life. So now I'm going to breeze through a couple more slides and then hand it over to Chris with some more concrete voting stuff. I really like this website um, to kind of help you really um, simplify the voting process. Chris might have other ideas as well, but myvote.wi.gov is a super accessible website. That's where you're going to be able to see you know, what's on your ballot. Um, you're going to see where your polling place is. You can even track your ballot. So like, just let's say that you um, submitted an absentee ballot or you're going to, this is going to tell you if it was received, uh, when it was received, um, kind of help you to verify that if that's something that is concerning to you. So um, it you can't register to vote online anymore. That's expiring today, but um, it's certainly going to give you that sort of information. So this is one of my favorite websites that I think really simplifies the voting stuff. So Alex, I think we're going to breeze through the next couple slides. So let me check them out with yeah, you. Yeah, I just want to say on the on the registering to vote online. Um, I think that closes three weeks before. An election is that right, Chris? Today, today is the last day. To yeah, but it's normally like three weeks before each election, essentially, right? Right, correct. Yeah, they they block out, um, they block out the site for registering to vote three weeks before an election, and that's just to give the um, election officials time to write out all the print out all the polling books and get it all prepared for the election because it's a big day for them. So that's kind of why they have that blackout period. But then after the election, then it'll open it up again if you want to register for the next election. Um, right. So it's really with those three week periods before each election that that there's a blackout. But you can, you know, hop back on the week after the election or something and and register to vote um, for the next one. And that's just for the online process because you can still in Wisconsin, which is unique, you can still register right at the polls on election day, right, Chris? Mm -hmm. Yes, you may. Which I think is pretty cool. So let's. Could you go to the next slide, Alex? Yep. I just want to touch on um, this issue because I think it's important for people with disabilities is that a lot of people get confused about guardianship. There are a lot of people with intellectual developmental disabilities who are under guardianship in Wisconsin, but that doesn't always mean that the judge who wrote those guardianship orders has taken away someone's right to vote. So it's really important to know if you have a guardianship or if you're the guardian of somebody, they, do they still retain the right to vote? It should be in those papers. So it's important to check that. Um, 
And if it is uh, a right that was taken away and you would like it back, there is a way to restore that right to vote. It doesn't take away your guardianship, but you can get the right to uh, vote restored. And that is something that a lot of people across Wisconsin are, are, are actively doing. And um, you would contact the Disability Vote Coalition. They have great resources on that, or you can contact me and I can direct you. But it's a really important thing to know. Um, not all people with intellectual developmental disabilities are incapable of understanding the issues and um, being capable of making a voting decision. So uh, it's just something really to keep in mind. So next slide. You can move through the next slide. I know Chris is talking about this next one. Uh, why don't you give me to your rights as a voter, Alex? I'll tell you when to, yeah, right there. So just some parting thoughts from me, I think are that just things to remember, whether you're a person with a disability or not, you have the right to vote privately and independently. Um, you do not need to have somebody next to you while you're voting. Um, your voting place must be accessible. Um, that is a requirement. There is something called curbside voting, and that's something you can talk to your clerk about. You should probably make a plan for if that's something that you feel you need to use. Um, curbside voting is where somebody comes out to your vehicle to provide the, the um, ballot to you. And so if you can't go in, either as a result of your disability or maybe you're having COVID symptoms, but you still want to vote on election day, this is something that you could use. Um, there should be an accessible voting machine at your polling place. And you can also ask for accommodations. So here's some ideas, ask me for a chair to sit in rather than standing in line, um, a signature guide because you have to sign the poll book, magnifying glasses are all things that you can request. Next slide. You can also have somebody with you at the polls. It just can't be your employer or a union representative. That's part of the law. Um, but, but somebody can go with you to help you. You can bring a cheat sheet. So if you want to study your ballot ahead of time, so you know uh, kind of what you're thinking. If you make a mistake, you can request another ballot. Um, no one should be telling you how to vote. And here it says not even your guardian. You don't have to agree with your guardian on who you're voting for. Um, you can file a complaint if you feel your rights have been violated. And this helps improve the system for others. And the Disability Rights Voter Hotline, they man this regularly. In fact, they are taking calls every day. So people who have any questions about voting now for people with disabilities, or if you have trouble on election day, um, this is a number you should keep handy uh, to help you, you know, report and you know, correct any um, voting issues that you have. Next slide. So here's a way to get in touch with me. Um, if you want more information like I presented tonight, if you're interested in staying in tune on state and federal disability issues for people with intellectual developmental disabilities, you can just text um, the ARC Wisconsin, all caps, all one phrase, the ARC Wisconsin to the number 22828 and that gets you added to my list. And so I'd really appreciate that's a way to um, you know, to encourage me and to thank me for my information. If you'd like to sign up, I'd really appreciate that. And then my contact information is on the next slide. And that's all I have for this evening. So I'd like to turn it over to Chris so she can give you the practicalities of voting in Sheboygan County. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Williams, and I am a poll worker for the city of Sheboygan, and I help out at uh, City Hall around election times. And I'll talk about uh, uh, absentee voting, early voting, and voting on election day in uh, person. And Alex is kindly putting my slides up for me, and you can... Um, when you online uh, absentee voting is, is over today, but you are still able to go to your city clerk in your town or city and request um, an absentee ballot, you would just need to take 
a picture ID and some kind of proof of residence, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, after a clerk can help you fill out your request for an absentee ballot if that's needed, or you may bring someone with you that will help you fill it out. Um, and if you do absentee voting, um, once you get the ballot, fill it out, sign it, put it in the envelope that is provided, and make sure you have a witness sign it and include their address. That is very, very, very important. We have to return the ballot to you if there is not a witness and they don't include their address. Um, if you are going to mail it, please make sure you mail it no later than they're suggesting October 28th or 29th to make sure it will be postmarked um, November 3rd. An easier way probably to do it would be to drop it off in one of the three drop-off boxes that we have in Sheboygan. There is one that is located outside of City Hall on 9th Street. There is one inside of the lobby of City Hall. And there is a drop-off box at the end of the library, Mead Public Library drop-off. So you can just drive up in your car, drop it in, and be done with it. As of this point, we've sent out just a little over 8,000 uh, absentee ballots in just the city of Sheboygan, and we've gotten uh, almost 5,200 of them back already. And the request, wow. the phone was ringing all day, and people were walking up to the counter all day today when I was there working. Hey, Chris, um, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, for anyone who isn't in the city of Sheboygan, um, for other municipalities, drop-off boxes, um, would they get, did you include those in like the absentee packet that the people get? Does it show the locations usually? Or yes. like would they call their town clerk or? And for example, in the, in the town of Sheboygan or the town of Wilson, um, they, have their, they have a municipal or city clerk that takes care of all of it. Okay. Also. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I, was, I heard that some places, and I don't think it's in Wisconsin, there are unofficial drop boxes showing up. And there are drop boxes that's not really supposed to be collecting ballots. And mm -hmm. people put them in there thinking that they're official and that their ballot will be counted and it, it won't be. Do you know if we have anything like that happening around here? No, we have nothing like that. That is out in California that that is taking place. Okay. So, yes, and they're collecting them in churches and, and gun shops and different things like that also out there. So luckily, no, yeah. we don't have anything like that going. We have zero incidents of fraud here in Sheboygan, which is nice. Yes, I would say the key thing there is, you know, knowing what are the where the legitimate locations are, because, you know, we did Chris just explained the three that we have in Sheboygan. And if um, if you don't live in the city of Sheboygan, then like we said, you, you should have gotten in your packet when you vote absentee, it should have an instruction sheet in there that will tell you where you can drop it off. Mm -hmm. But also you can always call your city or town clerk or village clerk to figure out where you can drop it off. Mm, correct. And usually at a minimum, you can at least take it to the town or village or city hall. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, early voting starts next Tuesday, October 20th. And it will go until Friday, October 30th. And that's when you will be able to start actually going into City Hall. Um, and if you are registered, just request, you know, show your picture ID, um, request your ballot. They have carols set up. You'll be able to vote and drop it right in that City Hall drop box. You can also register during that same time. You can actually register and vote that same day. Um, at your city hall, municipal hall, whatever, you, wherever you are. Um, and as always, you may have help completing your ballot. There is a line on the ballot that says a sister's signature, and that person would sign the ballot. 
and just say when we when we go into the nursing homes and help people vote there we make sure we sign on that line that we have assisted them if we have marked it for them or just read it to them whatever assistance they need we sign our names that we have helped um, if you choose to vote on election day in person um, voting will be at your polling place from 7 a.m to 8 p.m if you are unsure of where your polling place is you may call your city or municipal clerk and uh, receive the answer to that and as Lisa mentioned, if you are physically unable to leave your car, not feeling well, or you have trouble walking, whatever the reason is, um, either call ahead to arrange curbside voting or just have someone who drove you run in and say, this happened to us actually at the, at the August election. She ran in and said, I need someone to come out and help. Two of us will come out with the ballot and the poll book We'll make sure that you're a registered voter. We'll hand you the ballot and your envelope. You would vote, seal your, seal your ballot in the envelope, give it to us. We would take it back inside and you're all set. Chris, um, yes. If, if um, there's a lineup, which there might be, will they, what if it goes past 8 p.m. and or you're standing there and, and you're still in line at 8 p.m.? The, the rule in Sheboygan, is that at 8 p.m., one of the poll workers goes and stands behind the last person in line at 8 p.m. So even if that line would be two, three blocks long, and then nobody else may join the line after that point, after 8 p.m. But everyone who is in line up until then is considered a good voter for that day. Um, if you are coming in to vote, and need help, there are many options. Um, we always have a wheelchair accessible table with a carol around it that you may you know, pull up to and, and vote. Uh, the person from your ward will bring over the ballot to you and, and um, help you with it if you need help. There will be a handicap accessible machine and it has uh, headphones and a mouse that goes with it. Um, always, there will always be a poll worker to help you read the ballot if you need it and help you mark it if you need it. And then again, they just sign on that line that they assisted you. Um, anyone other than a boss or a union officer may help you mark your ballot. So your family, your caregiver, a friend, anyone. Um, and they just, again, will sign that they assisted you. Can we have the next slide, Alex, please? Oh, you have it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I should look up. <laughs> Accessible photo IDs. Um, acceptable ones are, of course, a driver's license or a state ID um, or the receipt that you have gotten that says your license or ID is coming. Of course, a uh, veteran's ID is acceptable. And for uh, uh, uniform services, your passport book or your card, we will take. It's always interesting when people bring those in and you kind of see the places that they've been traveling. Um, a student ID card plus, you must have an enrollment verification that you actually are a student um, if, you're, if your card has been expired. Um, a tribal ID card is acceptable and a certificate of naturalization. Those are all acceptable photo IDs. And then for proof of residence, anything that comes from the government is always considered acceptable. Again, your Wisconsin driver li driver's license or your state ID, a utility bill, a paycheck stub, hunting license, a concealed carry license, a student ID and the, the fee receipt, um, a bank statement, your affidavit. Sometimes we have homeless people that um, come in to vote, which is certainly their right. And they may come um, with a paper from a shelter that says um, so-and-so lives by the tree in Fountain Park 
or something like that. And that is perfectly acceptable. Um, a residential lease or an IRS check. Any, any of those are good proofs of residence. And if, that was anyone, has, if anyone has any questions for me, I'm glad to answer. Kathy, you're muted. We already voted. Yay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanted to say to you. Is, or go, Kathy. Oh, I, I encourage my, my kids to all vote ahead of time, but one of my daughters insists that she wants to go on election day. She doesn't mind standing in line. And I'm thinking, oh, why would you do that? But anyway, yes. Does she go I, black Friday shopping too, Kathy? Pardon? Does she go Black Friday shopping too? <laughs> <laughs> uh, she shops all the time, except for the COVID <laughs> now. But otherwise she does. But she just likes the, uh, the the feeling of being there with all the people. But, you know, it's, um, yeah. Well, so I, I, well, maybe there's a good time of the day that she could go. Oh, a good time of day would be um, mid-morning, mid-afternoon are good times. And we're keeping okay. the polling places very clean. We all have uh, bottles of spray and scrubbing cloths, and we're all wearing masks and face shields. We're giving everyone their own pen to use as they come in. So we're trying to keep everything as clean as possible. Yeah, I would say one thing is, you know, especially in with the COVID stuff going on right now, you have the ability to vote early, do it because you don't want to be there at eight o'clock getting in line. It's that last person and, and then standing in line for, you know, another hour or something. Um, you know, we have the opportunities to vote absentee or vote, vote uh, early. So I would just recommend using them just because it allows you to still exercise your right to vote, but not go crazy trying to find <laughs> your way into the polling places on, on, right. uh, no, I'm and I'm concerned that if people don't feel well on that day, but they haven't voted and they want to, they're going to be very tempted to stand in that line, not feeling that's well, right. so they that's can exactly. vote. That, that's our worst nightmare. Yep. <laughs> that's our la our worst la nightmare also. <laughs> that's why we voted early. This was really informative. Um, I sure hope that the, the um, recording worked, Alex, because, you know, I think this is such good information. I I learned some things that I hadn't learned before. I, I was going to say that my vote, um, wi.gov that Lisa mentioned, I love that site. And I always check my ballot. And, and then I, I send the ballot of all my kids where they are, tell them where their ballot, what their ballot is. And one of the things that that wasn't mentioned that I think is important is that oftentimes there's a referendum on your ballot that takes you by surprise if you don't look at it ahead. You might feel like you're prepared for the candidates, but all of a sudden there's a referendum. And for some reason, they're so confusing to read and understand. So um, that's a good thing to check ahead of time, too. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just for people that might be worried about it, it is an actual government site. The .gov means it's sponsored by the government. So it's not like it's just an organization that's doing it. It's actually the state of Wisconsin um, sponsoring that site. Mm -hmm. um, putting in your address and stuff should be safe. And and the, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, the other thing that, that we talked, I think we mentioned it maybe once was you can also see if you want to know where to vote. You can look it up there too. Um, put in your address. It'll show you what your polling place is, what your district is, um, all that kind of information. So, um, if you need that, you can you can look at that website also. I liked the the um, one you gave us about the link to Facebook pages for um, officials because I have to say that calling somebody, just doing a cold call is really hard for me. But if I just type a question, that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable to do that. 
Yeah, I always tell people who aren't used to talking to their, well, first of all, I say it's good to get comfortable talking to your elected officials because they put their pants on one leg at a time, just like all of us do. But if you're not, if you're not the sort of person that likes to have conversations like that with people you don't know, that a good way to kind of get into it is I either tell people, leave a call after hours because a lot, a lot of elected officials do have voicemail and they do check their messages. Most important thing is to name, leave your name and your uh, street address so they know that you're a voter for them. And then, um, and then, like you said, you could do a social media message or question or even send something in an email too. I had a friend who said, just put them on speed dial. You just put them on your, on your favorites list so you can just, you know, find them right away, but I, I haven't done that. But, and also I, um, when you were talking about um, interviewing candidates, I sent something to Leah today, the League of Women Voters posted this um, webinar on their website. And then they sent something to me today and I forwarded it to Leah because they are going to interview candidates and that will be available if people want to listen to that. So um, I, I don't know. I'm, ho I, I'm hoping that maybe that's something that Leah can put on our website too, if people want to listen to that. Um, yeah, we can. I mean, of course, the candidates will have to agree to do that, but I think some of them have, and, and so that's worth listening to. Yeah, and just a note for people that may not know, we always at Hearthstone hold an event each year um, for the, we call it our legislative bowling party, where we actually mm -hmm. invite legislators to come out and bowl um, and, and hang out with our participants. And uh, it's always a lot of fun. And this year, I feel like we had three. I think so. Uh -huh. I think Terry Kassman was there, Glenn Grothman was there, and who was the third one? Tyler Vorpagel. Tyler Vorpagel. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. So um, I, which I'm pretty sure is all three of our residents going to cover our area. So they, they all came out and, and were talking to people and everything. So that was really cool. So we, we usually hold that every year. We did it this year, I think in like January, February, right before COVID hit. So that was pretty much our, our only in-person event this year was, was the, the bowling party, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to do another one next year. Um, mm -hmm. This stuff starts clearing up hopefully soon. Right. And I, I know Lisa- have Your other Senator, Senator Devin Lemahue. Yeah. The other one who covers the Sheboygan County area. He might have been there actually. He was there before we got there. Oh yeah, he, yeah, he was there for a little bit, yeah. So I think we had four. And I, I know, Lisa, when you talk to Hearthstone, you, um, whatever your personal um, allegiance is to whatever party, um, regardless, this is, everybody has somebody you're, they know or love who has somebody with a disability, whether you're Republican, independent, Democrat. And when people, when candidates are aware and they see the faces like they do at the bowling party, it makes an impact on them. So, um, yeah, disability yeah. issues are are and should be nonpartisan issues. I've heard a lot of people say it's the minority group that you can join anytime and that most of us will join as we get older and acquire disabilities. So it really is. That's the way to present the issue. I don't think it's it isn't um, that one party, you know, likes or supports the issues any more than another. And I think the more that we can talk like that and share our stories as family members and people with disabilities that um, we need champions from both parties in order to get anything done. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So good. Good. Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us and um, uh, hopefully the recording worked. It looks like it's been recording the whole time. So we'll uh, post that online and um,